Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people from the Android community. I'm Chiu Ki Chen, and today we are chatting with... Corey Ladislaw. So Corey, where are you based, and what do you do? Uh, I'm based in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I uh, write Android apps, so right. um, I'm also writing a book, and I did a video course on Android Katas today. Right. Well, yesterday I did a keynote. I don't know, I've been oh, speaking and right. teaching. And kind of so we are actually... This lovely backdrop is provided by DroidCon New York City. We are on the second day of the conference, and on the first day, Corey opened the conference with a really, really inspirational keynote. Thank so you. it's been great. It's called Android is the World Phone, so hopefully the video will be up sometime and we'll add it to the show notes. Awesome. But today we are going to maybe touch a little bit on that topic, and then we'll go on to testing, which is another of your passion. OK. Uh, so in your keynote, you were talking about how I really like the phrase you call it um, privilege, right? Like the fact that when we develop apps, we just assume that people will have the latest phones, they will have the best charging situation. Can you just touch upon a few things that developing worlds or emerging markets may not have and we should be aware of as developers? Sure. Uh, well, first, the idea of privilege kind of comes from the whole feminist um, sure. critique of stuff in general. Uh -huh. And then um, as far as emerging markets, like they might not have access to electricity. Mm -hmm. They might not have um, a good internet connection, either Wi-Fi or data right. network. So there's a lot of different challenges that you might face in those areas. Yeah, I, I just really like the way you phrase it because it's so easy to just pretend yeah. that we have everything on top of the line, but that's not the reality. Well, we also do that with just our code, too, and throwing it over the wall to QA if we have it at our org. Right, because like, right, okay, like, it's ready. everything will be perfect. Uh, no, far yeah. from the truth. And speaking of that, I think testing actually feeds right into it, right? Testing help you catch problems. Um, how do you approach testing? Uh, so I use test-driven development, or TDD, mm -hmm. so I like to write my tests first and use that to auto-generate code a lot. Um, and yeah, so it just kind of leads your implementation, mm -hmm. usually leads to something simpler and easier to maintain. So when you say you use test-driven development, is that the uh, red-green refactor yes. cycle? Yeah, so cool. uh, I write a test, it fails, then I write some code, and then it passes, hopefully, and then I, if I feel like it, refactor a ton of stuff. Cool. Um, so it's kind of interesting because I feel like I've been trying to do test-driven development, but I never actually did it because the first step was to write the test. Mm -hmm. And I feel so crippled because I'll be trying to do, well, for example, I want to find a view with a certain ID. But because I have not written the XML file yet, the autocomplete doesn't work. So I was like, OK, I have to type everything out. What age do we live in? Right? So I just feel like it's a little bit um, counterintuitive. Like what, is the, what is the advantage of writing a test first? Well, so um, you can use some code completion, some things you can't code complete. Right. So I do a kind of a mix. I'm not like a purist. Okay. And it has to be like you have to write this first and then that. I'm not right. a purist really in anything. Uh, I just lean more heavily towards test-driven development. So like, for example, when I'm writing a calculator, which is in my book, I have you know a button for each one of the different buttons that you're going to press. Right. So I created one button with the test, and then I like duplicated that all the way down, changed all the IDs and stuff, and then went through and wrote all the tests for them. Or I would duplicate it ah, one at a okay. time because that's more. You really want to keep it like more incremental and as small as possible because mm. if you change a ton of stuff and then you run the test and they fail, you don't know where it broke. That makes sense. So it's kind of a mix. You just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, because I get lost. like in that particular example when I look at kind of the way people describe test-driven development, I would assume that. That was nothing. In the beginning, that was nothing. And yeah. then a test was written. Oh. <laughs> right? And I was like, that doesn't make sense. I will go actually make those buttons first. And then I will write some tests. Maybe like what I would do in that particular case, I would define the buttons. Um, and then I will go back to the test and say the button's not null. And then I'll come back and add some maybe um, label on the button. And then I'll go and verify the, the label. So like, I will actually make the app first and then go to the test and come back, but like iterate yeah, in very math. small steps. So the thing with XML is that's the one where you can't really code generate as much. Right. Some things work, some things don't, yeah. but in the Java land, you can like so auto-generate classes. And I actually write broken code and then use um, option enter to fix it and create classes for me. So stuff. when you say that like you, basically you are in your test and you're typing things that doesn't exist and then the IDE will go ahead and ask you, I don't know what this is. Do you want to make one that yeah. is called that? Okay. Yeah, so. so if I'm in my setup function and I'm right. like, um, 
I don't know the name of this class. Calculator activity sure. equals blah, 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 new calculator right. activity. If that doesn't exist yet, then I can just hit option enter and create I that see. class. Done. So it's actually, and then it's start it. And it's like, OK, well, now I want to do this other thing, new instance. So it's actually a very slight difference, like the test first, because it's like the first thing you did in your test is to generate yeah. your app. Okay. I'm lazy. So as much as I can cut out like typing actual strokes as possible, that's right. kind of what I leverage it for. So like to me, like it really isn't that I really want to test it. It's really more just I want it to go fast. Because like sure. if you build the test first mm -hmm. in like RoboElectric or whatever, right. instead of running it on the device, it's right. just a lot faster development cycle, and you can use the preview to just look right. at so the things and then you're, you're done. Basically, you cheat <laughs> by, yes. by having Constantly. a JVM pretend that it's Android, yes. and then you can take advantage of the JVM speed instead yeah. of the emulator or the real device. Yeah, and the, like, the tests I'm writing are dumb, and most people would say you don't need to do them, but I'm doing them because it like, just makes my life a hell of a lot easier. So That's very interesting, because I haven't actually done RoboElectric tests, because A, it was really difficult to set up like, yes. a few versions ago. I think things are much better. I haven't played with three yet, but okay. uh, two four was a huge pain yeah. to get work with. Android yeah, and, and uh, that was back in the Eclipse days, so like before Android Studio, which I know cool kids like use IntelliJ back then. But I was kind of like I waiting hate Eclipse for, from the moment. Yeah. I, I was almost forced to use it once, and that didn't work out. And I just yeah. I went back to Vim as soon as I could. Wow, and like to, you'd rather use Vim yes. than Eclipse. Yes, that say something. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, somebody showed me IntelliJ, and I was and like, like, oh yeah. I love this. Okay. I'm going to use this. Yeah. I mean, these are good. Exactly. So back then, back in the Eclipse days, um, Morbolashic was just a lot of different things that you need to set up before you even like, run. The first thing is really counterintuitive. So like, A, I didn't get into that. And then B, I was kind of, it wasn't clear what the shadow does. Yeah. So I wasn't sure whether the, the behavior that I'm getting from Robolatric will reflect the same thing on the device. Yeah, and um, I started using it when it was like pretty young too. So there were things that weren't implemented. Like, mm, so yeah. it, does the test fail because it wasn't implemented yeah. or because yeah. I did something wrong? Right. So you'd like debug but through I, the RoboElectric. Yeah. I am really jealous of the speed though, because I, I actually do a lot of espresso testing. Mm -hmm. And while the advantage is that I'm testing kind of the real scenario because it's running on the real device, yeah, it's slow. Yeah. Well, so um, <laughs> if you wanted to play with RoboElectric, though, mm -hmm. I created, um, there's two things. So there's a GitHub that's an Android Katas thing right. that you can just check it out. It already has RoboElectric well, integrated. Kata? Oh, OK. So uh, Katas are things that you do that are um, kind of just small, dumb things that you would repeat over and over again um, so that you can get used to the muscle memory of test-driven so development. So it's kind of like yeah, weightlifting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except yeah. it's a Japanese word. Yeah. And that's not mean weightlifting. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I have this GitHub that already has RoboElectric integrated. Mm -hmm because like you said, it's a pain to get right. started with. Uh, so you just fork it. And then um, I have an exercise in one of the branches, simple I'm, one, that you can go through and I do I really like tests. that trend, because I feel mm -hmm. like a few years ago, most of the tools or tutorials, they just paste blocks of code. And then yeah. you have to kind of figure out where to put them. And then and there's 20 different impl implementations, too. You don't know which one yeah, actually and then works. Things don't work, and you're not sure whether it's because you pasted something wrong, or because you don't understand the concepts, yeah. or you wanted to went two steps ahead and change something, and you broke it. Whereas I feel like when you can download a repository, then you have confidence that if it doesn't work, then it's their problem, yeah. not yours. And I feel like that takes a lot of the anxiety out when you want to try something new. So I'm glad that you put off that repository. Well, so there's the repository, but then I actually created like a video series that oh. walks you through it too. So you can um, buy the video, and then it'll walk you, buy the video, and it'll <laughs> walk you through that. And if you want to learn it by yourself, you can do that for free right. from uh, the GitHub repo, because right. it's got a readme on it. Right. Um, but this will help you if you want to keep doing it over and over again and get more familiar. That's great. Um, so have you done other kinds of testing, like JUnit, like without touching the Android part? Or? Uh, JUnit, yes, not as much in the Android space, but okay. before Android, yeah. Okay. And um, I want to play with Espresso. I haven't yet. But I'm going to actually start coding again cool. in two weeks with my new job. Nice. So yeah. um, I sh will probably so be I actually, it. So <laughs> I actually tried um, RoboElectric because I felt like I should. Um, and and. It's a pretty interesting story, I think, because what I w wanted to do was I have this watch face FitCat, which I want to generate the bitmap out so that I can visually inspect it. And so I thought, hey, 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 you know, I can just use RoboElectric so that it's fast. Um, so I generated the bitmap, and then I look at the file size, and it's so small. And so it turned out that the shadow class, what it does is instead of actually making an image, it writes down the instructions that you gave the bitmap class. Oh, so, interesting. So it writes, draw circle this color. And then you know, draw this text, and 
I want to visually inspect, so I can see how yeah, that's, that's really useful. more of like an integration level right. test. Right, know? exactly. So I ended up writing uh, kind of an in-between thing. So it's not um, espresso test, it's an instrumentation test so that I have access to the context. Mm -hmm. um, so I can load in the, so like the, the, the um, fonts, the assets, and the strings and everything. Um, but then I can visually actually have like real bitmaps rather yeah. than the instructions. Like, so that actually kind of opened my eyes on, oh, that's what they mean by a shadow class. Like you can exercise all the co-paths, but the behavior is different yeah. because it's a JVM implementation and it kind of serves a different purpose I almost feel like. Yeah, um, yeah it's definitely focused more towards the unit testing side of things instead yeah. of you know, the functional yeah. immersion properties. And I, I haven't played with um, UI animator or Calabash. I haven't done anything with that. Other, other um, we're Monkey. using Calabash. Oh, so you're at, using Calabash. Well, I'm not. My team was well, using Capital One. Well, you have experience yeah. in watching other people <laughs> yes, use Calabash. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I manage people who use Calabash. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I think the advantage of that is um, the barrier of entry is lower if mm -hmm. people don't have a strong an engineering background. Yeah. Um, if they come from more testing background where they used to probably <laughs> just, yeah. just use their fingers and then it's take them one step closer to automation. Yeah, and we were using um, acceptance test driven development. So basically the BSAs and product people were given given when thens and then the testers would code it and then go from there. Rollback, what is acceptance driven development? Oh, uh, be behavior driven development, okay. acceptance test driven development. So it's the same sort of thing you'd say, given this thing is happening, well, given this condition, when this thing is happening, this should occur. That sounds like uh, the Calabrash. Yeah, like, yeah, that's Calabrash. Okay, cool. Because uh, like I, my experience with that is actually with Ruby. I've mm -hmm. never done it with Android, but it sounds really similar yeah. to the outspec stuff. So. Yeah. Great. So um, we are good friends, so we can just sit here and yeah. talk all day long. But I think we will maybe to pick it up some other episode. Okay. Thank you so much for chatting with us. But, but I get to plug the book, right? So of I'm course. writing two books, and I have a video. Please go buy them. Yes, we'll add it to the show notes as well. Yeah. And of course, if you want to follow other wonderful things that Corey does, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, so you can find me at my website, CoreyLattislaw.com, mm -hmm. C-O-R-E-Y-L-A-T-I-S-L-A-W. Well, in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, <laughs> there's also the Twitters. I'm on there. And then uh, all my sketchnoting stuff is on Tumblr. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.